Um, okay, it says we're live. All right. Give it a second, maybe, to uh, have the YouTube stream come online. Okay, it says it's live, but I'm not seeing my screen. Let me see real quick. Oh, yeah, we're seeing it. I see it. Okay. Let's just check here. Hey, guys, I think we're live. We're just uh, just making sure that everything's coming through. Okay, looks like it's working. So uh, th thanks, everyone, for joining us today. We're uh, really excited to have you here for, for what will hopefully be an awesome and great and informative webinar. Uh, my name is Edward Quintero. I'm the co one of the co-founders of Mole3D, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar, which is character design for 3D printing. So today we are joined by Robert Vignon, also from Mole3D, and Ian Joyner from Legacy Effects. Ian's going to be covering 3D modeling and design techniques and how that relates to 3D printing. And Robert's going to be talking about how to process your models for 3D printing, as well as some post-processing finishing techniques to make your 3D prints look awesome. So before we get started, I wanted to briefly introduce what Mole3D is, who we are, and what we're about, and then we'll get right into it. So let's get started. So, as some of you guys probably know, Mole3D.com is a 3D printing website for designers and artists that was started by Robert and I about, about a year and a half ago. Uh, both of us come from the visual effects and animation industry, and we've been fascinated with this technology for about a while, now, for about, I would say, three or four years now. And back then, we noticed that there was a lot of hype in the media surrounding 3D printing and plenty of technology websites that talked about 3D printers and materials, but but there wasn't a lot of sites that were focusing on art and design for 3D printing. We felt like there was something missing, and, and that was basically the reason behind Mole3D. Um, one of our inspirations uh, were 2D and 3D sites like CG Hub, CG Society, ArtStation. Um, a lot of those sites that you, uh, some of you guys might be familiar with, they, they basically focus on showcasing artists and talking about animation and 3D modeling. So basically, Mole3D is kind of like a hybrid of these type of sites. They we, we focus on a lot of artists that, that do 3D printing. Um, here, let me show you guys a couple examples. So, yeah, on our side, we have uh, different type of artists from different backgrounds. Some come from sculpture, uh, you know, animation. Some are 3D modelers. Um, some are actually 2D artists that work with 3D modelers to create 3D printed designs. And here are some examples of some of the artists that we've featured on our site so far. So a lot of cool stuff. We also have a, a YouTube channel. Um, we call it Mole3D TV. Uh, we host where we host a lot of uh, free educational tutorials. Um, a lot of the videos focus on 3D modeling, design, and finishing techniques for 3D printing. Uh, actually, a lot of the stuff that we'll be covering today. So definitely check it out. Um, most of these tutorials are created in-house. Uh, recently, we've been featuring artists, uh, I'm sorry, videos from, from various artists as well. Uh, we had uh, recently a, a great video from Paul Braddock on how to cold cast your 3D prints. Um, so that it's just basically a great resource in helping you getting started with 3D printing. Another aspect of Mole3D that we're really excited about is our, our community. On Facebook, we have a 3D printing artist group which is a community of artists and designers that are, use, that are using 3D printing right now. So you'll find a lot of examples of 3D prints, people showing off their work, and probably one of the most useful aspects is the support from the members. So if you have a problem, for example, if you have a problem with a, your 3D printer, which does tend to happen, you'll usually find people who have the same 3D printer and are willing to help out and troubleshoot questions you might have. So a lot of awesome, really friendly people who are supportive and willing to share uh, their tips and, and techniques. So if you're interested in 3D printing and, and, or just interested in getting started, definitely worth checking out. Uh, another thing I wanted to show you guys is our latest project. It's a, our online 3D printing shop where we feature designs that are, are created for 3D printing. So, for example, if you own a 3D printer and wanted to print a design from our shop, you could download it here and print it out yourself. Um, and if you don't own a 3D printer, it's, it's still worth checking out for just the artwork. Like We have a lot of artists that we collaborate with that don't necessarily have the resources to have something 3D printed or might not even know how to 3D model. So what we do is we take their artwork, we model it, and we make it 3D printable. And it's basically, if anything, it's just an excuse for us to work with talented artists to get some artwork out there that might otherwise not 
be having been created for this medium. So for us, it's, it's a it's a cool experiment and something we're proud of and excited for. So keep keep the keep your eye on it because every month we'll be releasing new uh, new artists and new designs. And lastly, I wanted to just talk really quickly about our educational events, uh, like our upcoming 3D printing workshop that's coming up at the end of the month, and of course this webinar. So. So lots of good stuff that we hope will inspire you and uh, hopefully make you want to pick up a 3D printer and, and start creating for yourself. So that's basically it for Mole 3D. Uh, but before I get started, I also wanted to mention that we'll be doing a, a short Q&A at the end of the presentations. Uh, and I'll be taking some questions. So if you have any, be sure to type them into the comment box on the event page, and we'll get to them at the end. Awesome. So time to get started. Uh, let's start talking to our presenters. Uh, first up is Ian Joyner who will be talking about 3D design and modeling and how it relates to 3D printing. So welcome, Joanne. Thanks for joining. Thank, uh, welcome, Ian. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the intro. All right, guys. Um, so my, like he said, my name is Ian Joyner. I uh, am a character design um, concept artist, uh, mostly focusing on creatures in the past little while, but kind of do a little bit of everything, costuming and whatnot. Um, work at Legacy Effects. Uh, you guys might know them as Stan Winston Studios uh, from back in the day. Um, we use 3D printing a lot in our in our process. So everything from maquettes to makeups to uh, uh, to huge suits. So we're going to go through a little bit of that. Hey, Ian, uh, uh, before you get started, just make sure absolutely. that I'm not seeing your screen on. You're not seeing my screen. Yeah, so just make sure that we have that set up. Let's see. No, no, it's there. It's there. OK, we're good. Yeah, just we're good? that delay, so. OK, cool. Yeah. Great. So yeah, so let's get started. So um, I used to work at a place called Blur Studio. I did uh, cinematics for many years, um, everything from halos to superheroes to monsters, and really kind of still do a lot of the same work at Legacy. We work on Halo, and we work on superheroes, and we work on monsters. But uh, my passion was always in character creation. Um, and I always really loved the practical effects side of things. So. Fusing the 3D and the 2D and the uh, actual like 3D printing as well as using computers. I mean, everything just kind of came together when I started at Legacy. Uh, so just for a quick over overview of some of the work that they do, um, you may have seen them from Avatar, Real Steel, um, uh, boy, Iron Man. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, all sorts of stuff. And we utilize everything from clay to uh, full-on uh, printed out parts to full on milled parts. We kind of, whatever technology is going to work the best to get the job done quickest is what we try to uh, try to go with. Uh, and here's my little office, uh, my little home away from home. So the way I like to work is I, I focus mostly on the 3D aspect because I know where I'm going to go is things are going to go into 3D at some point. Either, either it's going to be a 3D asset that someone's going to animate or it's going to be a 3D asset that somebody is going to print out and have on their desk. So what I like to do is I'll start off with a, a sculpture um, in ZBrush, maybe take it really far, maybe not take it far at all. And in Photoshop, I'll do a whole lot of painting over, trying to find which direction I like, the client likes. Uh, so what I like to do is use a thing called DynaMesh, which uh, for anybody familiar with ZBrush, it's kind of like digital clay. Um, and uh, once you kind of figure out what you want to do, you're able to take that any direction you want. So I like to use them to then make uh, a little Pretty, uh, pretty piece of concept art as well. Uh, here's some stuff I did for my class at uh, Concept Design Academy. Same idea here. Taking it from a very rough form to a final projected um, finished piece, and then to a piece of concept art. What's great about this workflow is that if uh, if they like the piece, if they like the character, we can turn it around and start working out. You know, either give it to the animatic department or do a 3D print of it and just be ready to go. Uh, have something that's uh, like really there, no uh, no next phase. Um, so most everything you see at least started somewhat in the 3D realm. Uh, usually when I when I work, and a lot of times we do this stuff for pitches. And for this particular project, we had to make a suit that somebody was going to wear, so we had a scan of the actress. I did a concept that they liked, and we were able to print that thing out, and uh, pretty much within a couple days, have it on the desk for a pitch meeting. Um, I don't know if I can say the name of the project. It is something that did come out, but by a different director. So <laughs> we'll leave it there. Uh, so not only do we use a lot of the 3D printing for making maquettes or making giant hard surface suits, uh, we actually started using it even in some of our makeups. And this was a project that was scrapped, 
but you can see a little bit of the zebra sculpt. The design was initially done by my friend Simon Weber, uh, then I did the sculpture of it. Um, and then we fitted over the actor to make sure it was all going to work in, in the 3D world. And then we printed out the parts. Um, they then were going to use uh, traditional clay and actually sculpt in the parts that were going to get super, super thin. We've since been able to even print out some pretty amazing little appliance pieces to start with, but uh, sometimes you go back to the old methods and they're still the best. And sometimes it's quicker just to, to 3D print these things. So um, you, know, you always want to know what's best for the job that you're going to be on. And then, of course, uh, you, when you're making, um, talking about 3D printing uh, suits, uh, the Iron Man movies really, really utilize that a lot, especially the first two. Um, what was really fun working on this one is that not only were the 3D parts uh, going to be uh, the suit that was being worn, but we also got to use them to make um, things for Sideshow collectibles, which you could have bought. And you still can buy other ones. These are for Iron Man 2, so they're long sold out as well as full-size, you know, seven-foot-tall robots standing in front of you or suits that somebody's going to wear running around. So you can see there's the digital model, and there's the final maquette by, uh, that we did for Sideshow. But the, the fun thing is these are the actual models that were used to do the full suits, so there's no, uh, nobody had to try to translate any of this. Uh, one of my favorite projects I've worked on there was uh, Cowboys and Aliens. I don't think it was a huge success movie-wise, but it was uh, really fun to work on. And one of the cool things we did on this was utilize a lot of different technologies in, in new ways. And this was back in 2010. Um, so we did these designs, and they were picked and kind of approved and ready to move forward. And one thing we weren't sure about was the head, so we actually had a bunch of magnet heads. But all of this was done on an object, printed out, and uh, then painted by the very, very talented folks there at Legacy. Whoever did this one, but I shouldn't say that because I don't remember who did it. But uh, it looked great, and we had these little magnet heads to kind of figure out what the final design was. As you can see, that's a different head on there than what uh, the previous one was. Once we had an idea of what the head was going to be, we th we printed it out, and uh, originally we were just going to do what we call a clay press on it. We we're just going to mold it, get a clay version out, and the guys were going to go to town on detailing it. What we discovered on this project was that the detail was really good, uh, way better than we expected. And on this initial print, we realized if we went back and kind of changed some things, we'd be able to get it done completely digitally and completely 3D and then just have uh, the artist sculpt on the areas that wouldn't have made sense to print out. So what was wonderful about this is we knew that it was going to be a one-to-one -one for the approved design, no questions asked. Um, and it worked really well. And here you can see some of the initial design. And then there is the final one. Uh, so this, these were all just the printed parts before molding and, and everything else was involved, but kind of holding it together to make sure that it uh, you know, looked good and the forms read well. So it was a great learning experience for me working on that project. And uh, I think it was a great learning experience for the whole shop. Um, but not always just doing uh, the, the really fancy um, expensive prints. We also did some milling for the body because it was just so gigantic. And the sculptors then went in and, uh, and re-sculpted the ZBrush details that just weren't able to hold up into the foam. And one last example from there. Uh, this was for a project called The Watch. Um, we did a bunch of quick designs, some Photoshop, some 3D. This one was the uh, final approved design here. Another shot of it in action. And then we knew this was going to be a suit that was going to be worn. So what we wanted to do is first make sure that we were all really happy with it. So we took the uh, zebra sculpt, which you can see in the upper left hand side, and, and printed that out, base and all. Um, then we, uh, w once we were happy with everything that got approved, we sent it out to the printers. We actually, our own internal printers. We had it printed out and painted by, I believe that looks like Johnny. Uh, Johnny Trefka is a very, very talented guy who works there. Check out his work. Um, and it was approved. And you can see the final two uh, beauty shots on the bottom there. Uh, great little bases made. Some some parts were printed, some parts were actually just done on the floor. And uh, once it was all finished, the budget wasn't as high, so what we had to do is actually we, we milled this one out and had the uh, sculptors go back in and try to recreate what was lost from the digital file again. Um, we actually, using a denser foam, got some great looking, uh, great looking parts. And here you can see uh, actor Doug Jones in the suit, uh, having a good time. 
and that's the final suit. Uh, so once one last, uh, I think this is the last project from, from Legacy I'll go through, is uh, some work we did on Spider-Man. A lot of people were involved in the design of the character. We were kind of involved toward the end, um, actually from the very, very early beginning, and then toward the very end. So this was my last pass on uh, the lizard character. Um, and here's the, the full body, but we're going to print this out as a maquette. And then we sent over the, the model to, uh, to Sony to do all the animation and everything. Uh, we also did full-size um, uh, 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 STL prints on, on this, and it was uh, gigantic. I think the character was like eight feet tall, um, so his head is about three sizes from a human head. So it's a really, really big, big character, and we weren't sure about the detail was going to hold up. I have to say, it actually held up great. Uh, we're really surprised by what we were able to achieve with that. But if you look at this image, you'll actually see there are tiny little heads next to each one of these paint jobs. The reason for that is we printed out a bunch of little busts for ourselves to do these paint jobs on before we had to commit to the cost and the um, difficulty of painting the large scale ones. And to the screen left there, you'll see the, uh, the printed version of the maquette that we we're seeing. Now this was a half scale maquette and you can still see that thing is about four and a half feet tall. So everything from tiny, tiny parts to gigantic parts will be embraced. And here's a nice little shot of uh, the small scale and the large scale altogether, you can see you know, apples to apples, you don't really lose anything. And more paint jobs. Uh, and then lastly, there was these characters that we kind of cut out of the movie. I guess they kind of appeared a little bit, um, but they were a lot of fun to work on, very, very quick. And if I can, you know, if you walk away from this with any kind of uh, a tip or trick, I guess I would say the, the idea that I like to do is I do my Dynamesh base meshes, and I always retop them at, at some point so that I can then do iterations off. And the reason for this is I was able to do, I think, like two or three of these designs a day and um, keep some detail, keep some shape, and completely change it and wipe it away as I needed to, uh, which would be a lot more difficult if I was just doing Dynamesh and carving away from this every single time because you would lose everything. So you can see here there's the simple little rat. Uh, there is a couple different sculptures there with detail, all from the same source. Uh, what was fun also is you could take these and make morph targets and blend in between them and maybe you find weird shapes by doing two completely different characters and then seeing what happens when you do uh, when you bring them together. So it's a really fun way to work. It's something that you really ZBrushes just really shines at. And here's the final sculptures. And this one I believe was the initial approved one, but then they realized they weren't going to show the transformation, so we went with something a little simpler. Um, naked mole rat version. And I think this is the one that kind of appeared in the film, uh, somewhat like this. So it was a little bit easier to tell that was a mouse. Uh, now here's some 3D prints we did of these characters. Uh, you can see they're all keyed and ready to go, so we can mold these and um, you know make little kits off of them or whatever we wanted to do. Uh, these are the raw grows, though. And here they are together. You can see there's little gaps in some sections. That's actually just because uh, we haven't gotten and cleaned out all the support material. But it gave the idea of how they were going to look. There's some of the detail. These were very quick sculpts, so some of the detail uh, was just pushed as far as it really needed to be. And there, that one is all keyed together, too. Um, and I've also done a few things just for myself. Um, so this little guy kind of became my mascot for a while. Uh, we were talking, I got really into Harry Potter, and yes, I'm like 35 years old, but... Uh, and we started talking about house elves, and I thought, well, what would my house elf look like? So I pictured this weird little shriveled, angry little fella. Um, and I always kind of liked him, so I ended up doing a, a 3D print of him. Um, I'm actually, we just got him molded. I might be selling a kit of this guy. I'm not sure yet uh, if I am going to have the time to actually do that. But uh, I have started getting some parts back, so I'll at least have two, two runs of him, and then we'll see if I can get off my hump and actually make something out of him. Uh, if the lighting looks a little weird, it's because I didn't glue them all together, so he's actually lying down on these two images. But you can see the detail is pretty, pretty astounding. You get every, everything you did in the zebra sculpture pretty much showed up. Um, and then another last one here for personal work uh, was this little Count Orlock sculpt I did, which I did a lot of painting over. I think the hands and everything were just completely just uh, painted. But uh, we actually used a... Um, uh, MakerBot, and we really pushed it, and Jason Lopes over at Legacy, who is a genius at 3D printing, um, really pushed the MakerBot in a way I've never seen. You actually, these grow lines you see are actually material lines, so 
the overall detail on this, other than the teeth, which are a little bit raggedy, really shows up great. We actually have some pore detail and everything. Um, one day I plan on doing a clay press on this and uh, going back in and tooling up some areas I'd like to make a little bit fancier. There's something about a buck tube vampire I just always love. But it's not always going to be monsters. Um, sometimes you get to make uh, stuff for the family or stuff for um, costuming. Um, these were a cut from a movie, but these were going to be pieces of jewelry that we had done. Uh, these were about the size of your thumb. So they're very small, but the detail completely showed up. There's going to be a whole gown adorned in these things. They're very, very fun. I always wanted to see it finished, but they never quite got there. And the, the last little thing I will go over, and I think I've said the last thing a few times, but this actually is the last thing. Um, so usually I do the bloodthirsty monsters or the really cool suits or the crazy-looking um, demons from hell. Uh, when I got married, my wife wanted me to sculpt a, a wedding cake topper. And originally I was going to do it in clay and mold it and all this, but um, I'm just not as confident doing everything in clay. And I talked to the, uh, the guys at Legacy and I was able to use the bed to print this out. So what you see here is actually on the bed. And these are the parts as they came out. And I did this just as one piece. It was actually very heavy for a wedding cake topper, so we ended up having to make a little base for it and uh, clean it all up, make sure that it was nicely put together. There's the final, the final print of it, little cartoony penguins. And lastly, we painted them up, added some little fabrics and things to them to make, the, make it all kind of shine. My friend Scott Patton came and helped me, uh, helped me kind of get them all finalized for the... Uh, for going on top of the cake. But um, you know, one of the things I'm really excited about in terms of just 3D printing is just the various things you can do with it. Uh, we have friends who use it to make snowboard racks using their MakerBots. We have people who do jewelry. We know people who do, obviously, the crazy cool suits or cosplaying or everything you can imagine. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to move on to, uh, uh, to Robert and let him, let him take it from here and talk a little bit about the process. Hey, Ian. Thanks, man. That was really great uh, stuff. Um, actually, we had one question. Uh, just jump in to... Uh, Wait, just... Can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so we had a question. Someone asked, uh, do you use ZBrush to do all of, all of your keying? You know, yeah, I, I have in the past, uh, but um, we used a software called Magix uh, at Le Legacy, which is a very expensive, very cool uh, um, software that allows you to do really precise work. Uh, so, yes and no. Um, for my personal work, all the little imp guy you saw and all that, that was mm -hmm. done, uh, I believe, just with ZBrush and uh, Max. And even the Iron Man stuff that you saw before, it was before we actually got Magix, and all of that was being done with um, ZBrush. And then what I like to do is I would take, uh, I would do the ZBrush with open holes, collapse it in Max because it would do zero zero collapses as opposed to Maya, which seemed to want to go to uh, corners, and what I mean by that is it literally went to the center of the hole. Yeah. So I knew that my male and female ends were going to be keyed pretty much precisely. They mm. have that jagged look, which actually gave them kind of a natural key, but it's only really okay for the organics. For the more mechanical stuff, what I would do is I'd make the open hole, take it into max, model my male and female ends, and then have to cap those two pieces together. It was very time consuming, uh, but it did work really well. It just wasn't. Um, it wasn't very streamlined, and it was kind of stressful because you were hoping everything was precise. Yeah. Uh, the technology now has gotten a lot better where it's actually, you can do these things a lot easier. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. And uh, let's see if there's another, another question. Um, well, I think that's a good for your... Yeah, I think that's it for the questions on you. Let's, I guess this one... We have one other question by Max uh, who... Um, which I think I'll be covering a little bit in my in my slideshow. So okay, great. Well, then um, awesome. Thanks. Thanks for the the, the slides. They're amazing. Cool. Thanks for listening. Uh, yeah, definitely. So it looks like okay. I guess I'm live now. Um, so hey everybody. My name is Robert Vignon. Um, I'm a 3D modeler, sculptor by trade, and uh, and now I'm currently co-founder of uh, Mold 3D. Um, and I wanted to talk to you guys about how you can take uh, 3D printing and use it as like an artistic tool at home, uh, whether you want to do your own toys, your own maquettes, uh, you want to be making your own designs. 
um, and um, those uh, those types of things and what what all is involved in doing something like that. So this is kind of uh, on my screen is kind of a typical setup of what you might need. You're going to need a, obviously a 3D printer. You're going to need epoxies, uh, glue. Um, a lot of like isopropyl alcohol, um, especially if you're dealing with uh, stereolithography, uh, 3D printing. And uh, so for me, I'm using the Form Labs uh, Form One uh, Plus uh, 3D printer, and um, it's a great printer for doing uh, pretty much five five inches by five inches uh, 3D prints. Uh, you can't really go much larger than that uh, at a time, but you can always slice up a character into mul multiple pieces and. Um, and uh, print out something larger as well. Um, SLA uh, printing is really good for extremely high detail prints, and um, it, it, that's kind of its strong suit. So we're going to go into that. So here's a more of a close-up of a, a bunch of tools that I like to use. Um, some key ones uh, that I really love is actually our next slide here. Um, and I pretty much boiled my whole workflow down to these five components. So I have a foam sanding block. I have a pair of model clippers. Um, I have an X-Acto knife. Um, I like the bigger. The, they have like different uh, diameter handles and thicker blade X-Acto blades. I like the thicker one, not so much the thin one. Uh, I like these nail files you can buy at any kind of beauty uh, supply store. And uh, to me, a surface primer is really good for uh, giving your uh, 3D print uh, base coat before you do any kind of paint work. Um, the, the primer is nice because it's very thin and won't fill in a lot of the detail. Um, because in this type of printer, you actually get uh, all your pore details uh, coming through, which is, um, which is pretty great. Uh, so the next thing I wanted to show you is kind of, for anyone not familiar with SLA 3D printers, but maybe you've seen stuff like a uh, MakerBot uh, or, or Ultimaker type printers is uh, you can see how this one prints inverted and so we have uh, the print that sticks to the build plate and there's a laser back here and it, what happens is as this uh, build platform moves up in the z-axis um, the laser kind of runs back and forth and cures a layer by layer uh, eventually producing a, a 3D print for you. Um, so one of the cool things that we at Mol3D got to do is uh, we got to take a trip to Netflix and do a, uh, a uh, sort of a print for their logo um, when they uh, released the, uh, the documentary um, about 3D printing. And so this is a logo that we did for them. And it was printed on the Form 1. So it's not uh, uh, limited to just cool creatures and stuff. You can actually do a lot of really interesting, high-quality products. And then on, a, on the Netflix logo like this, it comes out really sharp edges. There's no real cleanup to do, um, except for removing uh, any of the support structures. Um, so we had a guy ask about how do we break up the character into multiple pieces uh, to have it be assembled and um, uh, and in a way that's smart, maybe get more 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 bang for your buck in terms of printing larger on a platform because you're taking out certain pieces that were naturally together. Um, also, uh, a lot of the quality 3D printing comes down to print orientation. So um, I wanted to talk about theory of breaking out a character. So um, you see how the hands are in the center here, and they have supports that kind of touch the, I would say, like the wrist area. Um, that would get plugged into the arm, which has a hole in it, so that's the key. And uh, the reason why I did that uh, for this particular one is uh, so that if this whole arm was a part of the character, um, you would probably end up with support structures on each fingertip. And that would be almost impossible to clean, and you would run the risk of breaking the finger. So breaking out the hands individually um, allowed me to uh, uh, allowed me to print this in a way that is most uh, beneficial for post-work cleanup. Same thing with the ears. I wanted to print this character really tall. Um, this one ended up being an 8-inch print. So the ears were printed separately. Um, this model here is one of our shop artists, uh, Peter Koning. Um, this is called the Boonie. Um, really cool character. I have a picture of him later on, too, all finished up. So you can see how I actually printed him upside down where all I had to do is uh, clean up a little bit where the supports were contacting the, uh, the top of the head here. Um, now, 
I was talking about supports. Um, one of the, I guess, one of the biggest downsides with SLA printing is that there's all these supports that you have to clean up. Uh, when you move over to one of the bigger, more industrial size printers, um, they don't utilize this type of support structure. They actually have a support structure that's more like a waxy uh, material that you wash away. Um, those printers, uh, you can print bigger, uh, bigger pieces, um, but I found that you don't get quite as high of a resolution in terms of details uh, with those 3D printers. Uh, so if you're thinking really small scale stuff, um, this particular printer is essentially a consumer version of what they call an Envision Tech printer, which is usually used for making really crazy high detail uh, jewelry and uh, even um, like Warhammer figures. Um, the sharpness that you get out of those printers is, is quite amazing, but their price point is out of the range of what consumers can really buy. Um, so the next thing I want to show you is the um, another character. So this sculpture was done by Dominique Quick. And um, for those of you really familiar with FDM printers, uh, you're going to notice that we're always printing at angles. Um, and this is kind of a big tip that I have for you guys uh, getting into uh, resin-based printing, whether you have a Form 1 or you have a Titan or any, any other SLA printers coming to market, is that uh, these printers love uh, angles. They don't really like big, straight surfaces. So you can see even this base that I printed is uh, printed at like a 45-degree angle. And that's because um, you don't want to print one continuous layer all at one time. Um, which would have a lot of stress on the printer uh, during its uh, peel process, and it would also have, uh, uh, you might get a lot of problems of the, the model of sort of falling apart while it's printing. So uh, you can see it, all these things kind of have like a really unique orientation. So when you're thinking about printing stuff, um, think about we're going to be uh, covering a lot of how, how to orient prints uh, to get the best results and to minimize uh, cleanup. And so uh, let's go to the next slide. So there's another piece that we printed. Uh, this shark uh, 3D print was done by a friend of mine, um, Adam Ely. And uh, this thing is about, I would say, five inches or so. And you can see that I even printed all the little teeth in there. Um, and we oriented this piece just at the right angle so you could print out uh, the fin. And uh, only the edge of the, the fins really needed supports. And then it was able to build out from there. So. Um, 3D printing is much like uh, filling up a cup of water, um, and you always want that to be at, a, at an angle. So um, so this is a character that we printed actually on a MakerBot, and uh, a lot of people ask us, like, hey, how come your prints are so thin? And they don't really realize that there's so many different types of 3D printers out there. So um, this is probably, like, on the lower end of the quality that you might get on a, a FDM a 3D printer. Uh, you can see that you have things like... Uh, the, the build lines that go all the way up, that's where the extruder is rotating around and sort of resetting. And you kind of get a seam, and then you also get this horizontal lines all throughout the character. Um, there are some cool advantages to these types of printers, obviously. Like, you can print really large. You can print more functional stuff. It's much cheaper to print, so your cost per print is much cheaper. Um, so there's a lot of interesting uh, aspects of that uh, printing. And, you know, I really like both of them a lot. So. Um, so I want to talk about uh, some finished products and some particular challenges that each one had. Um, so this is a sculpture that uh, I ended up doing, and um, this was actually uh, this is a larger version of the very first print that I did a few years ago. And um, the collar, uh, you can see how thin it is. Um, I thought for sure that this was going to be a failure uh, to print, but it actually printed quite fine. It's very rigid. Um, and it actually didn't need any support material because of the particular angle that I printed it at. So um, if I printed it different, um, you might have gotten a lot of uh, failure. So um, analyzing a print before printing uh, inside of a, uh, the software is uh, always crucial to getting successful prints. Um, another cool thing is you can print, uh, I mean, one of the best things about 3D printing is you can print multiple Characters. I mean, you know, you don't have to uh, uh, cast and mold each one. Um, I can actually print four of these little uh, boonie characters out on the same build tray at one time uh, at about four uh, four inches or so, three three to four inches. So 
Um, and you can see them, they're all getting painted. I mean, I'm using a macro lens camera, so you can actually see like little, uh, I don't even know what these are, little hair fibers sticking off. Um, uh, and so those all get painted. Uh, this is a this is actually a workshop print from our previous. Uh, this is a student work from our previous workshop, and um, he ended up doing this cool uh, uh, sailor guy. And uh, you can see the brim of the hat was super thin, and it was really important not to have support structures on that particular piece of uh, model. So what we ended up doing is cut the hat off, print it separately, and then it sits on top of the head. And then this way that we can print it in an orientation that is very favorable. And uh, the brim of the hat printed uh, perfectly. And the same thing with the pipe. It could have been printed all in one go, um, but then you would have had support structures coming off the bottom, and then they would have hit the, the bottom of the character. So we decided, hey, let's take the pipe out and uh, put a little hole inside of his mouth, and then we'll print it separately, and then it can later be assembled. So it's, it's a very similar process to thinking how to build um, things to be cast and molded. Um, but we're actually doing it to save us time and trouble rather than uh, technical limitations of molding. Uh, for example, with molding, you can't really do a lot of overhang. So, uh, whereas in 3D printing, you can. Uh, so it's, it's the same process, but sort of uh, different reasons. Um, this is a character that we did uh, for um, uh, a, store, a shop artist of ours, uh, uh, Paul Braddock. So he did the model and we prepped it for print. And uh, his, uh, just so you know the breakout, he, his crown was separate, his body was separate, his legs um, and uh, legs down to the uh, base here were one piece, and um, his arms were cut here, and then the front of the staff and the back of the staff were separate, and then this arm was separate. So all those were different pieces. And um, what we ended up doing is be really clever about how we cut up the model so you really can't tell um, where pieces are broken out. So um, his legs actually tuck up under the belt layer, but the, the belt area here, and you can't tell that. Um, so what we did is uh, use uh, software like ZBrush to cut up in there and sort of uh, Boolean out areas to make it so when you assemble this character, there's almost no external seam lines to clean up. Um, so we try to cut up stuff where things make sense. Um, this this uh, model uh, in design was done by a friend of mine, uh, Shannon Thomas, and uh, the giraffe itself was printed in one go, and then the base was printed. And you can see that it even got these little grass fibers. Um, uh, this is a character bust that I did, um, and I just want to show there are you're always going to see some kind of layer lines. Um, with most 3D printers. Um, it really depends on the printer, but uh, just to give you an example, this head is only the size of maybe like a pinky, and while it's easy to spot these in a photograph, um, this is using a, micro, a macro lens, so all the lines are visible, um, but using a technique uh, called wet sanding, so basically you dump this in a little bit of water and take out a foam sanding block, you can actually smooth away a lot of these lines and maintain a lot of your detail. Um, so here's the here's a golden version of that Boonie character that we did. Um, so he's been all assembled. You can't see where any of the parts were broken up. So a lot of things um, were are broken out in a way so that when you do assemble them, you can't really tell um, because we actually design. We like to design our characters that the 3D print itself has the potential to be a final product um, with minimal cleanup when possible. Um, this is a cool sculpture by uh, our friend uh, Gio Napkill. Um, and so this is uh, done as two pieces. He's actually hollow inside, and, um, and then he was glued onto this base. And um, you can see some of the little areas, like these little uh, points sticking out here, are areas that I didn't really um, clean up too well. Um, but overall, uh, you know, the, the, all the details there, it's, it's almost a one to one to the ZBrush sculpture. This guy's about five inches or so. Uh, one of the biggest strengths of uh, SLA printing in general is that you can print really, really small. So this is the skull. This is a skull, uh, human skull model, um, and uh, this is you know a, a, the dime uh, for scale. And like this is smaller than a dime, and you see you get the, all the detail is still there. So, um, and this is printed at 25 micron. Um, this is another print that we did for. Uh, 
for a, a friend of ours, um, and he was a particular challenge because he actually ended up being about uh, eight or nine inches tall, and we wanted to cut him up into two major pieces uh, to print. So um, it's uh, actually pretty well hidden that this line right here, this is like his waistline. Um, so his his uh, his uh, jeans all the way up into here, and even his clip actually goes above the above the line of the seam. And you can see that actually breaks that silhouette. So we do things like uh, we want to try to do things like hide hide the the seam lines with different details and features of the character. So his his top part of the body actually sets inside of the jeans. There's a lip here, and it sinks back down. So he rests inside there. You can have a key in there to really hold it in. Um, and uh, and um, and it almost is not even uh, visible. And you can see all the detail in the um, uh, the shirt. Uh, wrinkles come through and you know that you can see some layer lines like these uh, streaks here so you can actually kind of get an idea of the orientation so the lines are going like this way he's printed sort of uh, 45 degrees on his back um, and so I guess I'm going to talk about a couple of those tools that I like to use and how I use them so here I, here I am using the razor blade uh, uh, exacto blade to sort of slice off the those little support uh, structures so there's a few here and a few here. So I like to use a razor blade to really carve those off. Another thing you can do is use uh, those, those you know, 99 cent nail files to really uh, sand the stuff down. Um, anyone that has, uh, is used to working with uh, FDM printers knows that it's really difficult to sand them. Um, while one of the best things about SLA printers is that this stuff is uh, very, very hard. Uh, which makes it really nice to work with. Um, so you can sand it, you can carve it, um, and it works. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, and it works well with um, with a lot of uh, traditional modeling tools. Um, and the last thing I have built, and um, I've been wanting to do a tutorial on this, but this is a paint box that I built um, for myself a long time ago, and it basically has a little uh, fan in the back, and uh, it's a little milk carton. A milk crate um, that uh, has been uh, sealed up with foam core with a ventilation out the back and uh, this allows me to paint indoors and have the uh, ventilation go out the back out my window so those of us uh, not fortunate enough to have like an outdoor painting area um, I kind of designed this based off of a um, sort of the way you paint a car um, so this is my paint box. I paint all my stuff in there. The, the row of boonies that you saw earlier is, is, is done in there. And um, it has a replaceable bottom too. So these are kind of different elements and things that you can build to sort of assist your, um, you know, your, your 3D printing and your model making at home. Uh, and so last thing I wanted to show is, uh, actually I think, yeah, pretty close to the last thing I wanted to show in terms of slides is, uh, so this is a Stoic from How to Train Your Dragon 2. We did a 3D print of him. Um, he was 11 different pieces. He was probably the most challenging uh, piece uh, uh, of a print that we've done. And um, we had to break him out smart because he actually was going to go and get cast and molded too. So we were not only printing it to be a one-off 3D print, we were going to do it so it gets molded and, and re-sculpted on and then eventually um, become a, a crew gift for the Dragons 2 team. So. Here's the final uh, painted version of it, and you can actually see, I'm going to flip back real fast, so you can actually see, so notice the cloth area here, it's uh, very plain. A lot of that detail, with the, so in the movie this is all fur, um, and in the 3D print obviously we didn't have that. So what you can do is you can 3D print it out, you can cast it into wax, um, and then you can actually sculpt fur on top of it, and then you recast it, and then you can basically output it to a mass production. So, um, you know, you're never really limited to one particular medium. You can you can go from computer to physical to wax. You can work with it uh, with your hands, and then you can go uh, cast it in resin again, um, and then you could, uh, you know, then you can make multiple copies, and then you can paint them, um, usually painting them by hand uh, when you're dealing with this kind of level of detail. So that's it for the slides. So, um, I just wanted to touch base on some of the ZBrush uh, stuff and, and how uh, I want to show you guys uh, where where I can where you can think of. Um, um, Ed, can you mute yourself, please? Coming through on the uh, the audio. Um, 
so I wanted to touch base on the uh, breaking out of a 3D print. So this is that St. Booney character by Peter, and uh, we ended up doing a really simple version. So he has a key, um, and someone asked about uh, also about doing uh, keys in ZBrush. Um, for our characters, we do all our keying in ZBrush, um, and uh, you can see how they fit up into the foot here. So this actually gives it a lot of stability. So if you weren't to do, if you weren't doing a key here, um, this would you could glue this down, but it'd be a weak point where the glue could break. So this actually gives it a lot of uh, attachment surface. Um, you can see we actually carved out a little place for his foot to sink into, and same with the back foot. So, um, and then in terms of the upper body, um, we essentially just uh, cut the hands off in an area that made sense. So, if you were to take this hand and uh, uh, move it up into there, you can actually see the forms kind of line right up. And and then when this thing is glued. Um, you can't even tell that there's a scene there because of the way the the way that we sort of uh, cleverly masked out the cloth to um, tuck right into this uh, the hand here. And so this this particular breakout is done for SLA printing. Um, and then I'm going to jump over to one the same version, same character, but done for FDM. So um, we wanted to prepare this character to be uh, printable uh, by like a MakerBot and uh, without any support material. So we generated all these flat slices of, of, um, uh, for the arm. So you can see it's cut here and here. And then there's these keys, uh, these guys here, that get printed out and sort of help attach this whole character together. And I just want to show you in, in uh, 3D print software how all these pieces are laid out. So you can see they're all flat bottomed. And then we're able to print them out um, vertically without using any extra support material. And they all get assembled. So. Um, some other cool things you can do. So this is this character was done by Shannon Thomas and uh, David Coleman. Is that you know sometimes you have like a feature like the like these ears, and uh, you can key them out as a whole piece. Like the whole the whole feature of the character can be a key, not necessarily just a little plug. And um, and then these can go and stick in, and then you essentially print these off separately, and then you can glue them in place. And uh, with a little bit of uh, glue in there, when it's all printed out, you can't really even tell. Um, and then this particular one was done with these keys. Um, I think we even have a YouTube video of how to build these, but essentially these types of keys are flexible, so they snap in much like a, like a toy. And uh, the last thing I wanted to show you guys is just that stoic breakout as, as how we did it. So you can see there's natural lines of features like uh, his skin uh, tucks down into the arm area where the key is, um, and the sword has a little bit of a you know, a full tang that goes into the, the handle, so you can't see that. And his body has a little lip here with little two guide points that it sits inside of this part. And you can see that he's completely hollow inside, too, to save on 3D print material. And then same thing with the base. He uh, it prints through into these little guide spots, and he actually sinks down into it. And then the, the bottom of this is all hollowed out to save on 3D print material, too. So, um, you know, there's a lot of things to consider when 3D printing, and uh, hopefully you guys kind of got a little bit of an insight into how you can think about breaking up characters um, for 3D print and uh, how you might go about finishing them as well. So that's all I got. Um, oh, I guess I want to show you. Oops, sorry, one more thing. I just want to show you that same Booney character with the support structures uh, and the preform software with all the lattice structures. So you can see that between this and the one in the MakerBot, it's vastly different uh, and, vast and very different theories and approaches. So uh, it's good to know them all, I guess. So hopefully that all made sense, guys. And thank you for, uh, for watching, for at least my part. <laughs> well, thanks, Robert. That was awesome. Um, hey, guys, so I just wanted to... Uh, to just kind of go over the, the fact that we are going to have a 3D printing uh, workshop at the end of the month with Ian and Robert, and we're going to be covering all these techniques in more detail. So uh, so I just wanted to kind of talk about the, the workshop itself. Uh, this is actually our second workshop. We had one last year with uh, Geo Napkill, and um, covering some, some similar techniques, all this one's going to be a little bit different. And uh, it was an awesome experience. Everyone got to... Uh, learn on the first day about 3D printing design and how to approach modeling for 3D printing. And that's what we're going to be covering this uh, in this workshop with Ian. He's going to be talking in more um, extensive detail about what he showed today. 
um, and and his experience of using 3D modeling for 3D printing, and he's going to be talking about all the ins and outs and 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 techniques that he uses. And, and we'll be doing a um, a sculpt from scratch, and you'll be able to follow along with him and learn all those uh, those awesome techniques. And on day two, uh, we're going to be uh, covering uh, the finishing techniques in detail, and it's going to be a hands-on approach where you actually uh, you're going to get a 3D printed model that Ian Joyner actually created. It's going to be a raw 3D print uh, straight out of the printer, and you guys are going to be able to actually take it apart, clean it up, um, learn how to do all the finishing techniques like the sanding, uh, the taking out the supports, the the, the painting, and Robert's going to go into into detail um, also of how to set up your model in ZBrush so that it's uh, set up in a way that is uh, best suited for 3D printing, like all the stuff that he was talking about, the orientation, uh, the, you know, the, the, the keys, and all that good stuff that, that you only get through, uh, through literally years of experience of, of 3D printing that Robert's uh, had. So all that stuff and more, it's going to be um, April 25th and 26th in Pasadena, California. We're going to have a link to the, to the website. Uh, to register at, at the at the end of this and uh, yeah last year was awesome so so hopefully you guys will be able to make it out and uh, here are some examples of uh, student prints from last year um, we also have form labs who is sponsoring the workshop and they're giving us uh, an awesome opportunity for the, the students to actually have their 3d uh, their, their models printed out uh, from them uh, using a form one printer uh, for, for a very, very super low price, that's, uh, you know, something you probably can't find anywhere else. So that's kind of like a bonus uh, thing that Form Labs is offering um, our students. Um, so before we uh, finish up the, the webinar, we wanted to go over some, some questions and see if you guys had any uh, specifics that you wanted Ian or Robert to, uh, to answer. So um, let me see if I could find some, some good questions here. Um, one second, Robert. I don't see the. I don't. I don't seem to see the questions. Do you have uh, any that? Yeah, yeah. So I guess uh, people are mostly asking questions inside of the event page. Uh, so we're just going to go through a couple of these. Um, so someone asked a while ago, "Is what 3D scanner would you recommend for scanning faces for life-size busts?" Um, so the big, the big type of scanning nowadays is using uh, photogrammetry types. Uh, scanning services, they use basically uh, like 80 cameras, uh, 80 DSLRs, and then you can real-time capture um, uh, uh, like a whole face at one time and texture detail. Um, that's what they use at a lot of studios uh, for doing digital doubles. So there's no real particular name for that type of scanner, but that's the best way. It's called photogrammetry. And uh, there's various services that do uh, life-size uh, scanning of that kind of thing. Um, Ian, do you, did you have any uh, uh, knowledge of, of scanning uh, at uh, Legacy that you can talk no, about? I actually, not personally, um, okay. but uh, we, we have a handheld that we use, and uh, what you were just saying is something that we've been just starting to play with, actually. So. Okay, so it's a, it's a handheld, uh, like, DSLR rig, right? Has yeah, yeah, yeah forget, I actually it. offhand forget the maker. Um, but yeah. Some person yeah, a ton of people. I mean, you could really do, do a DIY version. You could buy eight or nine DSLRs, and then um, you sync them up with a synchronized shutter, and then you can snap them. Um, as long as you get enough uh, camera angles and you have good lighting conditions, you can do full-on uh, uh, head scans with, um, pretty easily nowadays. Um, and there's a lot of free software as well. Um, let's see here. Uh, let's see. OK, so Max asked, uh, one thing I've struggled with getting into 3D printing characters is laying out. Uh, the pieces and or knowing how where I should break up the pieces um, if you want to mold casting. So a lot of that is um, having that experience is something that you just get with, you know, obviously there's educational tutorials out there. We do a lot of that on our YouTube page. Um, you'll learn some of that at something like a workshop that we're throwing. Um, but to be honest, a lot of that stuff just comes with uh, uh, doing it and doing it over and over again and sort of learning, uh, learning about uh, uh, cutting it in, in certain areas um, and, and, and knowing how to cast it and learning about tolerances and how much things uh, tend to shrink when you um, after you 3D print. Uh, any, any knowledge that you might have to share in terms of how you approach slicing a character um, up for 3D print? Uh, Ian? Yeah, um, it, it, some of the things that really matter are are you going to mold it? 
Uh, if you're going to do that, you really want to think about it in terms of, of how you need to how do you need to actually cut this thing up. Um, the other things you a lot of times you want to think of is detail wise. Like sometimes just how you align it on the bed or just fitting it on the bed. Let's say you've got a long lanky character. Um, by cutting their legs off, cutting them maybe at the uh, you know at some smart uh, seam lines, you could probably fit the whole thing on the bed, all pointing upward. Um, get great detail and have it you know in one or two beds as opposed to doing you know well I just have my whole character and I have to do a weird cut on him to fit there. So usually it's it really depends on the size of the bed you're going to have access to and what the final results are going to be. Uh, I think uh, Robert was covering really nicely when he was talking about looking at the. Uh, the hidden seam lines, like on the elephant, where you look at the folds of the fat and all that going around, mm -hmm. like that's a great, great tip right there. Is look for those things. Don't just cut in the middle of an arm or the middle of a face. Yeah. Um, and if you do, you know, there's there's ways to clean stuff up. But uh, it's like uh, the, the smarter you can be in uh, about the cuts, the easier it's going to be for you in the end. But in my opinion, when it comes to the 3D printing side of things, just making sure that it's you're getting as much bang for your buck in terms of Alignment and in terms of fitting everything on the on the bed. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, so this is a good uh, question for you, Ian. Uh, someone who's been, you know, I mean, I, I think you've probably been playing with ZBrush since version like 1.0, or yep, basically it, when it when it came in and when it started to do 3D. Um, do you have any like really good beginner tips for ZBrush? Like, what's the best way to sort of get in and 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 get going? Uh, would yeah. you say? Yeah, that's a good question. So. Uh, the thing that I like to, to tell people is, like, no matter what software you're going to be working on, no matter what art style you're going to start trying to learn, like, you're going to stink at it at first, right? So the, the best thing to do is to follow some tutorials on, on Zebra Central. And if you've got a little bit of sculpting, uh, sculpting knowledge, if you've got a little bit of, uh, of 3D knowledge, it's going to be a lot easier to jump into something like ZBrush. Um, in some ways. And in other ways, the program is so different than many other programs that you're going to have a little bit of uh, frustration sometimes. I've noticed a, guy, a lot of guys who are great in 3D software just struggle with the ZBrush interface. And sometimes yeah. it's like a random sculptor or a random painter will pick it up and within a day I can have them actually doing pretty good work um, because they already have the, the art foundation there. So uh, yeah. that, that's one thing. Uh, but I would say like the best thing, other than like interface, uh, in my class that I teach, uh, I always talk about ZBrush calisthenics where it's like hmm. just getting used to zooming in on areas and rotating around areas as you want. So, mm -hmm. uh, Edward, you were in my class. You might think you remember that, where I would say, like, okay, just oh, yeah. zoom in on the nose, rotate around the nose, zoom in on the finger, rotate around the finger, and go back and forth. And it sounds silly, but getting so comfortable with that stuff is yeah. going to save you so much time. Other than that, it's all it's all about your knowledge of form, anatomy, everything mm -hmm. else. But you know. I, I do think one of the best things you can do is don't jump in trying to make a creature once you kind of get the interface. Go try to sculpt a human. Go try to sculpt a skull. Try to sculpt uh, an animal. Something that really exists um, and, and see, what, see where, where you're falling apart. Uh, that, that usually seems to jump people forward uh, a lot better than trying to just be like, oh, I'm just going to make something up. Mm, that's good advice. Uh, awesome. Thanks for that, that tip. Um, Let's see here. Uh, someone mentioned that uh, SmoothOn makes a brushable clear resin seal that auto levels and fills in rough areas on a 3D print. Yeah, so we get this. Uh, so what we get a lot of people telling us about this. We actually have some as well. Um, that's a great material. Mostly going to be used on uh, FDM type prints. Um, basically, it's a it's a material that um, um, will fill in those layer lines that I was showing you on that um, octopus looking creature. Um, you're still going to get a little bit of a loss of detail because it's actually sort of filling up the, the lines and if you do put it over areas that you may have lines that are things you sculpted in, um, you know, you have to be cautious of that. But it's a great way to really smooth out a lot of detail and that is that type of material is actually not really necessary on uh, SLA type prints because um, a lot of the lines that you get are, are not actually uh, sinking into the surface, they're actually protruding out. Um, so uh, uh, they're easily sanded away and smoothed over with uh, like wet sanding and stuff like that. Um, let's see here, let's go on to... I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, Just reading it. See here. Um, 
let's see here. Uh, well, someone asked if the, we're doing a workshop in Europe. Um, not currently, uh, but uh, you know, we, we're, we're playing with the idea of putting the workshop uh, available uh, online after um, after the workshop is over. So if you guys actually have a lot of interest in something like that, just let us know. Um, send us an email or something, and you know, the more the more demand we have for it, the more likely we are to do it. So. And we are um, considering doing uh, workshops uh, in different locations. Uh, again, if you guys have like a particular city that you're interested in, and we have enough demand for that city, let us know, and uh, you know, hopefully we can make it happen. So. Yeah. Cool. Well, I guess uh, that's all the major questions that I have here. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. I think we got up to almost, uh, you know, almost 80 people. Uh, live, which is pretty good good turnout. So thank you everyone for watching. And uh, people ask, uh, is this video going to be available um, uh, uh, to watch later? Yeah. So if you only caught a piece of it, or you might have got here late, don't worry. The video, as soon as we shut down, it's going to be up on the YouTube channel um, at Mo3D um, uh, for you to watch again and skip through if you miss something. So. And if any of you guys want to uh, learn and. Go the you know learn the whole thing with Ian and Rob. We're going to be doing the workshop. Uh, we want to give uh, a special discount code to the people following the webinar. It's at the bottom of the screen there. Uh, that webinar O R O three R C. So if you go on to the uh, mol3dacademy.com/workshops and you register for the class, just uh, make sure to add that code and you'll get uh, an additional fifty dollars off. So thank you guys for joining us. Uh, great presentation from Ian and Robert. Thank you guys. And we hope to see you back again soon. Yeah, thanks for having us. I uh, hope to see some of you guys at the workshop. Yeah, yeah. Take care, everyone. Thanks, guys.